Hi, and welcome to Locks Thoughts, a channel where I give my thoughts on media I have been consuming in the past little bit of time, in the past times. Uh, today, I'm talking about a book by the name of Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Moss. Now, A Court of Thorns and Roses is a beauty and the beast retelling uh, where there is no beauty and no beast. Um, we'll get into that later. But to start us off, the story is about a girl named Farah, who I think is 18 for sake of the book. That comes into play later. Um, who kills a wolf who's actually a fairy while trying to hunt for her family because they live in like a ramshackle shack and they're poor. Um, it's a fairy, and she lives in a world that once had a human-fairy conflict. The fairies now live on one side of this wall. The humans live on another side of the wall, and there's, like, a peace treaty. But she broke that treaty, and so now she has to go live in the fairy world with the beast of this story, Tamlin. By the way, the world is, um, is... The author just took... Just she just she just took England and moved it down next to France. The English Channel is in a different spot now. That is that is all this world is. I was I went into this book with a lot of promise. So one of my friends recommended it to me, and I thought, oh, this will be a fantastic foray into some more like romance fantasy. I'm a fantasy person myself. I knew it was gonna be like a romance book going into it. Um, but what I learned is that Sarah J. Moss is the John C. Parker of our time. Uh, scamming the masses and profiting from it. <laughs> um, so things that I liked about the book, uh, I finished it. It ended. That was what I liked. I liked being free from this bond that I was in. Uh, what I didn't like, everything else. Um, the start of the book is slow. It introduces characters over time. I say characters loosely. They're all mostly one-dimensional. Uh, except for Recent, who gets introduced in the last, like, quarter of the book. Uh, he gets introduced earlier, but we don't see a lot of him until the last quarter of the book, where we actually get to see him fleshed out. He actually has, like, motivations, reasons for doing things, uh, interacts with other characters in a interesting way that isn't just like, I hate you, it sucks that you're here, it, I hate you, I want to leave. That's it. That's what most of the interactions in this book are. To dive into a little spoiler-free section, I already gave a little preamble about what the story is about. It's Feyre living in Prithian, the land of the Fae, the fairies, and it's her trying to assimilate to her new life, which is spent with a lot of time doing not much, there's hinted at that there is this darkness lying under Prithian that is threatening to come back up and threaten the land. That sort of teased for a good portion of the book ends up becoming what the main conflict at the end of the book is about. But that main conflict doesn't really come up until you get to about page 300. It's like a 400 page book. So it just leaves you with the sense of like, what's ha did anything happen? What, what, like, if someone were to ask me to, 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 to summarize the first 280 pages of this book, I could probably do it in about two pages of notes, which isn't too much. Um, and then it's all backloaded into the, the back section where the conflict is. Overall, no spoilers given. It's a pretty, it's pretty, it's a pretty mediocre dry read, unless you're like sixteen, a sixteen to twenty-four year old girl, probably. Not, I am not the target demographic for this book, surprisingly enough. So, that's my thoughts on that. Now, getting into the spoiler section of this video review thing. Um, so, Feyre gets shipped off to Prithian with Tamlin after he kills a wolf, and spends, like, a hundred some odd pages trying to figure out how to get out of this contractual obligation, because there's this, there's this treaty that was signed by both sides, um, this obligation because she killed a fairy to go to Prithian, and is to be there forever. For the rest of her days, when she was, like, the sole provider for her family, which we don't even get much context for, in all honesty, very forgettable until she leaves back to the 
real world, the human world, uh, at the end of, like, towards the, the where the, where, where the, the book starts to pick up. Um, and then even then, they're there for, like, a chapter or two. So she gets to Prithian, is not happy about any of it being there, and she decides, I'm going to try to leave. So over time, she tries to leave. Tamlin is like, no, you're not leaving. There's another character there, Lucian, who is Tamlin's, like, right-hand man. And, man, this just, it's a mess. It's, it's a mess. It, there's, fine, oh, it's, it's a mess. This book is a mess. There are courts, which I'm not going to get too much into because they don't come into big, too big of a play. There are different courts on England, which is Prithian. Um, and they they all have, like, their leaders. Tamlin is leader of the Spring Court. Um, Lucian is related to the royalty of the Summer Court. Um, and then... Pharaoh learns, she catches a uh, being called a Surreal, which gives, like, weak-ass prophecies about, like, they give answers, but, like, in riddle form, so just prophecies, but lamer, um, about how she has to stay close to Tamlin in order to survive the coming storm, the coming darkness. Um, and that darkness turns out to be, well, we get some, some teasers here and there with um, a discount Drakkar. If you or if you're a real time fan, it's a bat thing. It's a bat demon creature, um, who is trying, who threatens Tamlin at some points in time, while Farah is like covertly listening. And then a character recent, recent Reese, as he becomes known later in the book, um, also comes in and threatens uh, Tamlin about not listening to a character called Amarantha. 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 There's some, like, intrigue there that, like, the reader's supposed to, um, get involved with, but you never, you're never given enough to, to sort of find your own way to the answers until Sarah J. Moss gives them to you. We do see re recent save Farah at one point in time at this big ceremony celebration in the woods for, like, good harvests, despite the fact that the land is eternally spring. Recent saves her from some unsavory fellows. There's a lot of just, like... Most of the characters in this book are are men. And they're just all... They're, none of them are just, like, decent people. None of them are decent. Uh, Tamlin can't control himself. Lucian is weak-spined. Recent is just a piece of work. These three fairies, which I keep wanting to say elves, harass Feyre. Um, it's just all around. I'm just, it's just none of them good. None of them. None of them you want to root for. You aren't. You aren't cheering them on along the way. Um, but then we learn that there is a curse. On, oh, there is a curse on Tamlin where he has to wear. A, he has like a mask that is stuck on his face because of magic stuff that happened at a party uh, fifty years ago. It only covers, like, his eyes. So you can see the rest of his face. And he's apparently handsome. So that's why I say there's no beast in this. Because, like, he's handsome. Oh, he just he just wears some... He just he just wears some glasses all the time. He just... He just... Oh, look at me. Oh, I'm a different... It's like the Clark... It's like Clark... It's like Clark Clinton Superman, right? He puts on the glasses. Nobody knows who he is. But he takes off the glasses. And suddenly, he's Superman. Right? Um, and so, Farah over time decides that she doesn't she doesn't hate fairies anymore and that she uh wants to be with Tamlin forever apparently that just happens there's no motivation there's no arc uh and then we learn that Amarantha was the one who cursed uh Tamlin to live with the mask on his face and she's now collecting on this debt that was like when she cursed them that she, she had to find somebody to fall in love with that was a human because her sister fought in the war but was betrayed by a human who she loved. It was, it's, it's, there's so much condensed into the last like into the last 100 pages 
that retaining it all is a challenge. 100%. Like, it's an exercise in mental capacity. So, she calls Tamlin to her court, which is actually under the mountain. It's a secret eighth court. Recent is her or is her lapdog, who sort of antagonizes uh, Tamlin once he gets there. Tamlin ships off Feyre to save her back to the human world, but she's like, uh-uh. No, thank you. I'm coming to save you. So she goes under the mountain, immediately gets captured, uh, is tortured, gets her arm broken. Um, at one point, a character was skinned alive, but that was off page. That We just see the remnants of that in this dark place. Amarantha issues uh, challenges to Feyre to free Tamlin from the curse. Um, Feyre accepts, except at this point she has like a broken arm, is like dying from that an infection in a cell she was put in. And then Reason shows up and goes, I'll heal that for you. But you gotta, you gotta make me a promise. We're gonna, there's gonna be a bond between us. There's gonna be a bond. And I'm already like, no, I would rather, I would rather die from the broken arm. But Feyre's like, I gotta save Tamlin. I gotta save. I gotta. I gotta save Prithian because that's all. That also hangs on the balance. And Reason fixes her arm. She gets this weird like tattoo on her hand that connects them. And then from there, every night, um, b between challenges, because it's it's over three months of this that these challenges occur. Um, every night, Reason comes to Feyre, puts her in like. A see-through dress and takes her to the court where debauched things are happening makes her drink some wine and she forgets it all so to do with that information what you will to me not a fan not a fan but through all this time we learned that recent has some uh other plans in the work behind the scenes because he doesn't really like amarantha hence the reason that he's the only real character in this book um, so we see him sort of plotting and planning. Feyre passes all the challenges. Amarantha goes, I said I would eventually, but not immediately. And then she, her, the next challenge is that Feyre has to, uh, kill three fairies in front of her. She kills two of them. And then the ter third, the third turns out to be Tamlin. Um, and then she remembers an offhand comment that Lucian made about 200 pages earlier about him having a heart of stone. And so she drives the knife into where his heart would be. It hits stone. And then at this point, this 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 action breaks the curse. Tamlin and Recent are able to defeat uh, Amarantha, not before she snaps Feyre's neck. So Feyre lays dying on the ground, uh, seeing everything now through Recent's eyes because of the hand bond. And... Then all the, the High Lords give a little drop of power and Feyre is reborn as a fairy. And that's really where this book ends. And it is a whiplash in the last <laughs> climax of the book. It just goes and it doesn't stop. It drags on for so long in the beginning. And then it just spikes. Overall, I think I would give this book a um, look at it. Unless you are the target demographic, uh, look at this book. It's got it's got it's got artwork on the cover. It's got like a lion thing. Um, yeah, unless you're like sixteen to twenty four and a woman, don't read this. Don't save yourself the time and energy. So I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on this book. Uh, tell me what you think in the comments down below. Uh, don't forget to leave a like. And maybe subscribe if you want to see some more uh, see some more thoughts in the future. Thanks. Bye.